Um, just want to welcome everybody to round two of uh, Research Bytes Room 8, Time Domain. I'm Steve Ritz. Um, work, I'm the camera project scientist. I'm at UCSC uh, Federica. For covering up, um, we're ready to go. Uh, I think people have stopped moving rooms or has slowed down. So let's just start. And you have three minutes and I will tell you that your time is up at two minutes and 50 seconds. You get the timer, you set. And I will, I will monitor the chat as uh, Federica's screen will be full screen and she cannot see it. Um, that's right. And all questions should go through the chat and will be asked at the end of the five talks. Yeah. And off we go. Oh, I should um, point out reminders. We are running an inclusive meeting, so be respectful and be supportive. Show your appreciation for the speakers. You can use the clap button. You cannot use your thumbs up for the questions, but if you like a question that pops up in the chat, just write below that you like that question. And if you ask a question, put the name of the speaker you're asking the question for. It's at the top of each slide so that we can try and distribute the questions when question time comes. And with that, Yiping, you are up. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Yiping. Yeah, uh, I'm Yiping, a postdoc from MPA. So I'd like to uh, introduce a method that we developed for discovering uh, strong line squeezers in a time domain. The strong line squeezers, or line squeezers for short, are powerful tools for a broad range of topics, including galaxy evolution, stellar IMF, dark matter substructure, cosmology, black hole occlusion disk, and black hole host code evolution, many of which actually can only be done or best done with lens quasars. Applications of lens quasars, however, are currently limited by the sample size. And this figure on the bottom right shows the number of discoveries as a function of publication year. It is quite clear that new instruments and surveys usually lead to explosions of discoveries. And as we are now entering the time domain era, we design a method that can exploit this new parameter space. Next slide, please. So our method makes use of the fact that ideally variations of different lens quasar images are identical except for an offset in arrival time, which is known as the time delay. So here I'm using a simulated double image quasar system as a demonstration. So the middle panel here shows the variations or light curves of the two lens images. Mathematically, one can show that the other correlation of the combined light curve will have an access at the time lag that corresponds to the time delay. And this is confirmed by the right panel, which shows the other correlation of the combined light curve and the access at 30 days, which is the input, input time delay. And we've tested our method on simulated light curves with different qualities, some of which are actually expected to match the qualities from LST. And we found success rates of 30 to 60%. And we've also got a pretty similar success rate on observed light curves of 22 uh, known last quasars. Next slide, please. Um, thanks. Uh, so uh, the main advantage of our method is that it is very simple. So our method only relies on combined light curves, so no need for epoch PSF photometry. And as a result, it will be particularly useful for discovering small separation lens quasars that are currently underrepresented, represent, as they are challenging for other conventional methods based on imaging data. And scientifically, those small separation lenses can provide important constraints on the evolution of low mass galaxies. And LSST is expected to discover more than 3000 new lens quasars. And the figure and their predicted image separation distribution is shown by the blue histogram on the right. As a comparison, the orange histogram is for the known lens quasar population. There is obviously plenty to discover. And I believe our method can play an impo important role in this. So lastly, um, I encourage you to check out the paper if you are interested in more details about the method. Um, stop here, thank you very much. Thank you, Yuping, right, right on the dot. Next is Patrick Alejo. Hello everybody, thank you for coming to this talk on the Antares Anomaly Detection Filter written by myself and Konstantin Malanchev at the University of Illinois and on the behalf of the Antares team. Those of you who don't know, Antares is an alert broker processing the nightly ZTF alert stream. And one of the nice things about Antares is that you can write a custom filter to do whatever science case you would like. And 
for us, we were focusing on general anomaly detection, but just trying to find weird, um, interesting light -like curves uh, in as real time as possible, uh, specifically transient like events. This is an isolation force based algorithm trained on 1 million random Antares loci or objects in the night sky. And we use as an input 106 light -like curve features, 53 in the R band and 53 in the G band. Um, using uh, Constantine's new light curve feature uh, package that's also integrated into the Antares framework. Next slide, please. So in about the three months of operation of the filter, it's found kind of a whole suite of, of different uh, interesting things. Like there was a, a lensing event, 2021 QDL, as well as 2021 LFT, which is a type 2N. So it's nice and it's kind of agnostic as to the types of things that it's finding. Um, and although these were uh, discovered pretty early on in their light curve, there are um, you know some cases where the filter discovered or tagged something one night, and then we request follow up and we get spectra the next night. So right as these interesting uh, things are happening, or like a big flare, or you know something interesting, um, we can observe them and get spectra right uh, right as these things are happening. Um, but Although there are many things that are that are discovered by the filter, there are other things that are um, discovered and reported by other teams, uh, but also tagged by our filter, like peculiar type 1As and superluminous supernova. And those you can see uh, on the right, there all the different types of classes that it finds and then who, which teams have reported those as well. Next slide, please. Some things I'm working on right now is a dimensionality reduce um, feature representation of all of our uh, events uh, tagged by the filter. Some of them still have contaminants like variable stars and QSOs and other things, which I'm trying to filter out. But in general, I'm trying to find uh, representation where these different uh, transient classes as well as the most anomalous classes shown here by the these stars like superluminous and peculiar 1As uh, to try and find a, a good embedding where these kind of separate out into different clusters whereby when a new uh, object or event comes in as tagged by the filter, we can assign a probability and see if it's worth, um, like, like follow up to see if it's uh, really an interesting anomaly or, or not so much. So uh, working on the paper now and hopefully I'll have something to show you soon. Thank you. Excellent. Next up is Michelle. Thanks. Uh, I'm Michelle Lachner. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of the Western Cape in South Africa. Uh, very active in DESC and I work a lot on observing strategy, but I wanted to tell you guys about something a little bit different today, um, which is my work on using machine learning for anomaly detection in astronomical data. And uh, my colleague Bruce Bassett and I uh, developed this framework called Astronomaly, which you can see a GIF of on the left. Um, so it's a general framework designed to do anomaly detection on all types of astronomical data, and it has a, a web-based interface allowing you to um, actually give feedback to the algorithm uh, and improve it. So there's a couple of links at the bottom, a link to the paper and a link to the code, which is public, and it would be great if you wanted to try it out. So if you go to the next slide. Thanks. So the, the motivation for astronomy came from, well, I mean, of course, we know with the incredible amounts of data, 10 million alerts a night, a billion galaxies with Rubin, we know we, we have to do something about anomaly detection, we have to automate scientific discovery. But when Bruce and I started working on this, we realized one very interesting aspect of uh, anomalies is, unlike classifications where you have type 1A supernovae and type 1BCs, for instance, there's a sort of subjectiveness as to whether something is an interesting anomaly or a boring anomaly. For instance, I may not care about artifacts, but somebody who cares about data quality might be very interested to know about uh, artifacts in the data. So uh, Astronomy incorporates a novel active learning approach that takes user input and improves the algorithm to, to build a kind of recommendation engine for anomalies that you might be interested in. So there's very interesting potential for citizen science projects and maybe collaborative efforts on the Rubin Science Platform. And just to indicate on the left, I know that this is a transient session and I was showing you some images, so it works for image data, um, but this is a very nice example from a paper I worked on with Sarah Webb, uh, which is also linked at the bottom on the deeper, wider, faster survey. So trying to look for unusual fast transients. So it, there are, you are able to run transient data through Astronomy as well. So if you go to the last side, please, Fed. 
Um, so just to emphasize a little bit more, so this machine learning framework works for uh, radio data, such as Meerkat in the top left, decals, uh, optical data in the bottom left. Um, there's an example with CRTS transient light curves, and I'm, I'm hoping that maybe some of you want to try it out on your own data and find something cool and unusual in there. My email address is at the bottom, so please feel free to chat to me after the session if you're interested in trying it out. Thanks very much. Amazing, you're all doing so well with timing. Thank you so much. The next speaker is Zhao Lan Li. Yeah, hi, everyone. I'm Prof. Zhao Lan Li from University of Denver. And the most exciting thing of Ruby LST might be its potential to discover unknown phenomena, the phenomena we have never seen before nor predicted from theory. And the ability to make on uh, discoveries will depend on its uh, Ruby LST's observing strategy. How can we make sure that the observing strategy will not prevent us from discovery unknowns? We prepared two papers to answer this question. One paper focused on the time domain and the second one focused on the probe motion. The next slide. Yeah, evaluation of the ability to make on discoveries is a challenging task because it requires a model independent approach to avoid bias from theory or unknown rare classes. We approach this challenge by and explore the completeness of the survey in a feature space defined by five components, the flux change, color, depth, footprint, and star density. And we concatenate all those five figure merit as the overall figure merit for the unknown phenomena. Next slide, please. Yeah, we evaluate the ability to measure the flux change by the uh, time gaps at all time scales from minutes to years. The ability to measure color from meters within a short time range. Volumes explored by the service. This is done by taking into account the depths footprint and the star density. And next slide. <clears throat> and, and we created an interactive dashboard to visualize our results. And you can also visualize your any science cases just by scanning this QR code and upload a CSV file. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Zhaolong. And our last speaker, Matt Schwamm. Thanks. Um, so we've been partnering with the Zooniverse, um, which is the largest platform for citizen science. Um, and um, the idea is thinking about how we could take Lazar, which is the UK broker, and um, take the annotations and the alerts that are coming in now with ZTF Lazar, and how do we take those and put them on the Zooniverse platform? And thinking about this in a wider framework because there's many other brokers and they're all doing different types of things which you might wanna use as a researcher now and in the Rubin era um, when data is flowing, right? To decide whether or not you're going to use a telescope or um, again, to improve your algorithms to decide you know, um, what things are interesting. Um, and so we've been um, basically got a little bit of funding to have some time to think about this in terms of how do we connect Lazar and how do we connect these other brokers. And so what we've come up with a framework, which you can see sort of in this left um, hand side figure is basically you can take the alert stream, it goes to your broker, your favorite broker does its thing. In my case, my favorite broker has to be Lazar because I'm based in the UK. So Lazar has the fact that, you know, there'll be some annotations and extra data. And so the researcher can use this um, GitHub API that we built, we've built basically a Python a API you can use to connect your data to the Zooniverse. Through, and the idea being is it's on the researcher's computer. So no broker and the Zooniverse needs to have any extra machinery to do this. You take, we receive the stream, do what you want with the alerts, add extra data or extra data sets if you like, and then you can upload that data to the Zooniverse. So if I can go to the next slide. Um, 
what we have in um, is this GitHub repo. It works for Lazar ZTF. So you could take Z, uh, ZTF alerts, process them however you'd like. In this case, we have examples of making plots and adding figures, and you could upload that to the Zooniverse platform. So the idea being is that this can be a template and this GitHub repo and this code, open source code can be a template for making um, uh, your own package for other brokers or ready if you wanted to adapt that slightly to use Lazar data. Um, and so we've also written a note, which I think is linked in the GitHub repo, that's sort of thinking about talking through this process for, you know, all alert streams with Zooniverse in the, the Ruben era. But we think this work, the, our model sort of works pretty well and enables any broker and any scientist who wants to be able to use alert data to um, uh, have citizen scientists vetting that um, observations or looking at the combinations of data. Um, so that, you know, you can take that precious eight to 10 meter class uh, telescope time and use it um, the right way. So, um, so yeah, take a look at the repo. Um, and if you want to dive in, it should work for ZTF Lazar data. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Um, that's the end of the presentation. So show your appreciation by virtual physical claps. And Steve Ritz will moderate the questions. And we don't yet have any additional questions, uh, but the floor is open. Perfect. Raise your hand if you want to ask a question. You have to visually parse the difference between a pause and a question. You will hear my dog in the background. She's having a tantrum. Uh, that may make that may stimulate yeah. other dogs. <laughs> That's right. Jiping, can you tell us a little bit more about how you uh, what the prediction for the event rate for um, the quizzes that you described for LSST? What the, what those predictions come from? And then I'm going to mute myself so you don't hear the whining. Uh, yeah, sure. Well, so the prediction is done by Agree and Marshall 2010 paper. So essentially they predicted a few thousand new lens quizzes um, in LSST. So, um, well, basically they, they assume sort of a, a population of lenses based on the velocity dispersion distribution function. And then they combine that with luminosity function of quizzes to make the predictions. And so since this is a, we heard a lot about anomalies in this section would uh, would deviate what would a deviation from that prediction tell us would, would, um, do you can, is that going to be something that can tell us something fundamental about is it? Uh, yes is it? I guess in principle yes you know um, for example it could be used to test the luminosity function quasi luminosity function and its redshift evolution for example and as well, you know, the, the um, galaxy velocity dispersion distribution function, you know, basically they can provide the test. But I mean, the tricky thing apart is, um, you know, there is all the selection function and completeness. So you have to make sure you, you'll be able to correct for that in order to make um, predictions for the underlying assumptions, I guess. Thank you. That's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, we've made already a lot of connections in the chat room to work with uh, a lot of a lot of us are working on anomaly detection. So that's very exciting. And I will reach out to all of you after that. Um, More questions? I had a question for Michelle. Um, I can read the paper, but do you want to say a little? Could you say a little more, please, about how the anomalies are discerned what sort of algorithms or metrics sure yeah yeah i didn't i didn't have a lot of time to go into it so i'm glad you asked <laughs> um so the the framework is is built kind of like any typical machine learning pipeline these days in that it's pretty plug and play so you you can um read in image data transient data whatever you want and then um I have a standard set of feature extraction packages that I've included, but you could do whatever other feature extraction you want. It's kind of all designed to be 
um, relatively independent of each other. So for example, for the image uh, stuff that I was showing with the, you know, that showed the merging galaxies, I use um, isophotes. So I just really look for anything that deviates significantly from ellipses, which is a fairly simple approach, but was fast and works really well for, for that particular type of anomaly. Um, for the transient data, we've just been using this the standard feature set called Feats, which works okay, but I'm quite keen to, to try the feature set uh, Patrick mentioned actually. Um, so once you've extracted some features, you've reduced the dimensionality of the data, then I have also a standard set of machine learning algorithms like Isolation Forest, which, which Patrick also mentioned, um, which basically tries to figure out what, what normal looks like in this data set so that anything which is far away is classified as anomalous. And then the final step is at no point do we actually say this is an anomaly or this isn't, we just rank the data from most to least anomalous so that you as the user can basically go through it, labeling it until you're bored. And then once you've got a, a labeled uh, set about, you can actually rate objects based on how interesting they are. Then you can run this active learning approach that we came up with, which retrains the algorithm and resorts them so that you, you see more of things that you are interested in. So that's the, if I had an extra three minutes, I would have said all of that. <laughs> Happy to provide more questions. Thank you, by the way. Uh, I see Hiranya's hand. Uh, yeah, Hiranya, go ahead, please. Hi, it's a follow-up question on what you just said. I guess it's a question to Michelle and, and, and Patrick. So uh, yes, you can look at the things till you're bored, right? But uh, in the context of say something like ZTF or indeed LSST, how many things will be flagged to the user to look at? Uh, is it, I'm sure there's a threshold you can set, but like say the top 10 things that you flag up to the user, are they all interesting or what fraction of them is interesting? Do you have a sense I, of that? I'm sure Patrick's answer will be more, more relevant given that he's working on the actual ZTF data. But for instance, for, for like uh, some of the optical data, maybe 30 or 40% to me looked interesting. Uh, and then the rest were noise, artifacts, uh, anything funny like that. So my just from working with various data sets, my uh, experience has been around 30% is, is pretty good. You know, then you've got a pretty solid uh, feature set, but uh, I think things always get a bit harder in transients as always, especially if you want to do early classification or early anomaly detection, you're going to get many more false positives. So that, that would be my, my rough estimate. Yeah, <clears throat> for myself, I set a pretty conservative uh, contamination ratio in my isolation forest when I trained it at, <clears throat> excuse me, like a 1% or, or something like that. So um, like on a nightly basis, uh, I'm personally looking through like 30 or 50 objects per night and seeing if any of them are interesting. But, you know, especially when uh, the one, the goal is to like make it more or less completely automated if, if possible, or just alert for like the, the most extreme cases, because especially when uh, uh, LSST comes online, there's no way like humans are going to be able to look through so many. So it, that, will, that the contamination percentage and, and those kinds of things will need to be refined. But at this point, it's uh, I like I am personally looking through like the 30 ish most um, uh, or th like 30 objects tagged by the filter each night. So um, it's it's doable for now. But maybe maybe if I could add a follow up to that, I think this is where the the the, the extra kind of human human in the loop component is really important. And, you know, the thing when I was working on this uh, early on, it's relatively easy. I mean, I don't want to say it's easy, but it's relatively easy to detect anomalies. What gets harder is saying, okay, all of these anomalies are similar. You know, then you need a really discriminatory set of features. And, and I think that's going to become really important is not, not just always presenting the 50 most anomalous things each night, but prioritizing things that really look different from everything we've seen, or maybe this particular user is particularly interested in whatever, you know, peculiar one A's or something. So that user would then see more of those. So I, I do think this raises an interesting question about how we, how we best use the human resources that we have. 
And this is where the citizen science aspect is, is really fascinating and, and really designing how we combine the machine learning and the humans in the most sensible and kind of optimal way. Thank you. Thanks very much. More discussion on this or other questions? Nino? Um, yeah, as I posted in the chat, Michelle and Patrick, thanks so much for the talk. I was wondering if uh, the anomaly detection algorithm works with homogeneous data sets or can be customized to include data sets from other frequency bands. You, you show the DWF, which is uh, not just optical, right? Uh, have you thought, given some thought about that, like uh, the, the uh, algorithm for the detection, but also the classification will benefit if you also have multi-frequency data that are being simultaneous or semi-simultaneous you see a way to customize your yeah, your code absolutely yeah no it's it's already in there so for instance you can you can have multi-band images no problem and you can have multi-band light curves kind of built in um the, the i guess the interesting question is as always it's it's all about the feature extraction so how how do you design feature extraction that makes the best use of the multi-band information so you can trivially run your feature extractor for every band and then just concatenate those and there's your features, which, which works reasonably well because the machine learning will learn correlations between them. Um, but maybe there are more intelligent things that you can do if you know a little bit more about the behavior of these objects. Um, so for instance, um, uh, you know, like there's, uh, you can use multi-band Gaussian processes, for instance, that will be able to, to fill in the gaps by using multi-band information. So I, at, at the onset in astronomy, yes, you can put as many bands in as you like, but then it's a question of the best way to actually make use of that information. And I wonder if we could bring Yiping on into this discussion as well. I was wondering whether you have thought about how to use the band information. Would you do your autocorrelation with each band separately and then look for correlations in the correlations? Or um, have you thought about even more clever and daring interleaving of information? Or have you thought at all about how the band information would be used? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, so the test we did is for single band. And uh, but obviously with multiband, you will be able to actually um, be done, well, reduce the false positive rate, essentially, because you know, there will be many false peaks in other correlation function. And uh, so with multiband, you will be able to um, basically get rid of those false peaks so that you, know, you get a more pure sample. So that's one thing we um, did discuss about. Um, yeah, but that's basically just by, um, you know, multi, multiply the autocorrelation auto function from each band. Yeah, we haven't really thought about like deeper than that, but that alone, I think it will be already very um, helpful. Great, thank you. Yeah, but I guess, you know, maybe in principle, you can also try to increase the, well, reduce the cadence by combining multiband, which might also be um, interesting to look into. Thank you very much. And thank you, Nina, for the question and prompting that. Did you, I jumped in on your very interesting question. Did you have your question answered? I do. And to answer just very briefly, Michelle's uh, final question was, yes, there might be some clever way to do it that moves away from the typical feature extraction methodology, like deep learning approaches that I'm envisioning here. And that's something I'm, I'm looking at because the number of features that you have to extract can be tremendous increased by the number of bands that you add and there's also as you said you know cross correlation that you know and then the lack of data as well so there are probably other approaches that we haven't really explored in astronomy yet but i think this is a good uh, uh playing field i think yeah absolutely i mean the, the deep learning approach is a is a very sensible thing to try um and we you know we, we are looking at it um i i haven't found too many really good deep learning um well, it, it, the tricky thing is doing the anomaly detection and then the next step of, of being able to cluster things and actually find, like, you know, do recommendations is a bit trickier. Um, but yeah, there's definitely lots of things that you can try with, with deep learning. And I think we can, we can springboard off of what people have already done for classification, right? We don't have to reinvent the wheel. So it is definitely, um, yeah, and Fed's reminded, of course, Ashley Villas worked on using autoencoders for anomaly detection. It's very interesting. Definitely some good approaches there.
Excellent. So the session is actually over and uh, the room will close at an undetermined time in a few minutes. So we can continue asking questions, but don't be surprised if they close our room. And thank you very much for participating. Thank you very much to our excellent speakers. Thank you so much for sticking to the three minutes timeline, uh, which is really hard and you did a great job at. Thanks everybody. <laughs>